How does ATP actually get made? We're probably all very familiar with this idea here. When ATP is converted to ATP, it gives out energy and it requires energy in order to create ATP. It's almost the opposite of what you learn in chemistry, where when you break bonds, you need energy. When you create bonds, it releases energy. ATP works in the opposite direction. This is because we are talking about what is called Gibbs free energy, or nowadays Gibbs energy. Not just the enthalpy, which a lot of IB chemistry students are learning about. So it's not a contradiction to what you learn in chemistry, it's just another form of energy on top, which you will come to sometime in grade 12 usually. If we go down a bit more, here is our ATP. We're not going to worry about the chemical formulas. A and two phosphates attached in a row. And we have a third phosphate here. The whole deal is about building this bond here. Now how does this happen? We start off with electrons that have been excited. What does that mean? They're at a high energy level. And these have an energy level that drops. So they end up being the same electrons, no longer excited, at a lower energy level. Something's at a high energy and the energy level drops. Some famous guy said you can't lose or gain energy. It's always there. So if the electrons are losing energy or becoming at a lower energy level, we say in chemistry, then that energy has to be going somewhere. And that is being used to create this bond here. We now have ATP. In reality, it's not just one step like this. It's a series of smaller steps where energy carriers, each energy area is helping the energy level to cascade down. We could draw a quick diagram of the energy levels involved here, and it'll be something like this. ATP has a high level of energy, but of course chemists would be Gibbs free or Gibbs energy. ADP, and a phosphate, so it's a balanced equation I guess, much lower level of energy. This is very unstable. What is the benefit of ATP being unstable? It's easily broken down to ADP, releasing all that energy. The big question a lot of people ask is, how can an electron have more than one energy level? It's an electron. Well, I would say, think of a cold coffee cup containing cold coffee. Badly drawn, of course. There it is. Badly drawn coffee cup. It's got some energy. If I heat up that coffee, are there more or less molecules? No. But is there more energy in the system? The same cup of coffee, now very hot, has got more energy. What is that coffee going to do over time, that hot coffee? It's going to cool down. It's going to lose energy. But energy is not lost, so it's losing energy to its environment. The coffee cup's cooling down, the environment is warming up. ATP, as it goes from a high energy to a low energy state, that energy is used for whatever reactions required. When we're making ATP, our electrons at a high energy level, moving to a lower energy level, are giving up the energy that is used to bond the phosphate to our ATP. Another way to think of this would be to think about money. Here we have an electron, an electron with energy money. This electron is excited at a high energy level. Now, that electron is going to give some of that energy to ADP and phosphate. They are joined together by that energy, that is a bond, they are now ATP. Our electron has lost energy. It is now at a lower energy level. The same thing happens again. It is giving up energy. That bond together, our phosphate and our ADP. And finally, our low energy electron is being used to hold together two hydrogen ions and half of an oxygen molecule. The final resting place of our electron is to create water from the components, from the pieces that have been used to do chemiosmosis or the electron transport chain. So where does the electron transport chain actually happen? 
It's inside the mitochondria on the inner membrane. So let's draw an inner membrane. It's made of phospholipids, so it's a bilayer. There's our phospholipid bilayer bedded in the inner membrane, or the cristae, some proteins. There's a protein, different protein. Now this protein has a very distinctive shape. This is actually ATP synthase. So this is our cristae, inner membrane of the mitochondria. Now our temporary energy carriers, as we've discovered, are carrying electrons and hydrogen ions. They arrive here. Now what happens is they release the electrons and the electrons move in through this protein to in between the two layers of phospholipids. Electrons are charged. They can't get through the tails of the phospholipids. The only place they can go as more and more of these are brought in is along. Now as the electron goes through this protein, it drops an energy level causing a hydrogen ion to be pushed into the center here. Our electrons keep moving. There's more electrons arriving all the time. An electron arriving protein. As they go through the second protein, this causes a hydrogen ion to be pushed into the center. Our electrons work their way all the way around here, through here, and out. And as we've seen previously, they are used to bond half of an oxygen molecule two hydrogen ions, two electrons, to create water. But when we've done this many times, we end up with many hydrogen ions accumulated in here. Now one adaptation to make this really efficient is the cristae is really thin, so that many hydrogen ions build up in a small space, creating a repulsion force. These guys are repelling each other. Again, they can't go through the phospholipid bilayer, because they're charged, which means the only place the hydrogen ions can go is out through ATP synthase. And as its name suggests, ATP synthase is where we make ATP. Current thought is the hydrogen ions go through this, causing a piece of it to rotate, which attaches the phosphate onto the ADP. The exact mechanism of that, we don't need to know. All we need to know is we have our moment. ADP comes in and a phosphate. Something happens in here to do with the rotation and out comes ATP. This is called hemiosmosis. Some people get tripped up by that name. Osmosis refers to the diffusion of water. Chemi is the constituents, the chemical parts of water. Here we've got electrons and hydrogen or electrons causing hydrogen to move in it diffuses out through with the repulsion force behind it the ATP synthase so it is chemiosmosis because it's the parts of water that are causing this which is the process that drives the electron transport chain the last stage of respiration where we finally end up with our final energy currency our ATP this is what it's all about this is where something like 36 of the 38 ATPs from respiration are made. And of course it requires oxygen at the end to bond with the electrons as they come out making water. Without that oxygen, it cannot occur. So again, like our Krebs cycle, you must have oxygen for this to work.